Welcome to our special 200th episode of Fireside Chats with Jesse. I am joined today by our special guest, Peter Zion, geopolitical strategist. Thank you for joining me, Peter. That's great to be here. No, it's, uh, it's great to have you on this program. I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing you speak, um, you know, at a couple of ELFA events in the past. And, um, you know, it's just phenomenal to get a few moments of your time. So people in equipment finance who might not have had a chance to hear you speak or have not stumbled upon you yet can kind of learn more about you um, in your career, Peter. Let's get to it. Awesome. So do you mind just kind of introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, Peter Zion, I am in a geopolitical strategist, which is a fancy way of saying I help people figure out what problems and opportunities they're going to be struggling with internationally in the years to come. Uh, most of what I deal with deals with geography and how it shapes economic trends and demographic structures and how it shapes the possibilities of the future. Uh, the big thing that's going on right now everywhere is after 70 years of globalization, uh, two things have changed. Number one, the Americans are kind of backing away from the system and without security, there's no trade. And second, the whole world has industrialized and the whole world has urbanized. And when you have urban, when you go into an urban lifestyle, kids go from being free labor to an expense. And so you have fewer of them. And you do that for 70 years. And we have a number of countries around the world, ranging from the United Kingdom to China, that this is just the decade that they run out of young people. And by young people, I mean people under 50. Uh, and that makes a very different economic model that we have yet to invent. And the transition from here to there is going to be, uh, well, let's just use the word rocky. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that introduction. And, um, you know, we can dive into that, um, you know, further later on. But, um, you know, as you've been involved in a couple of these, like, ELFA, um, you know, events in the past, what are your thoughts on our industry from a high level, Peter? Oh, you guys are going to do just fine. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, when the United States created the global order, the whole structure was built about making sure that other countries would do well so they would stand with us against the Soviets. It, it was a flat out bribe and it worked. But now that the demographic structures have changed so much, the consumption base for what is necessary for globalization to work isn't there anymore. And so we spent the better part of two generations helping other countries develop their systems. And that means that we went into higher and higher value added, so less manufacturing, more services. Well, now that those systems are failing, now that global trade is failing, now that global consumption is plummeting, we don't have enough manufacturing capacity to serve our much younger population. And they've got too much industrial capacity to serve a population that no longer exists. And so unless we're going to pay for a lot of these countries to exist, and the idea of the U.S. paying for China to exist, I think is a stretch. We need to build out our industrial plant. And what is it that you guys do again? You build things. You work with people to build things. So we're talking about doubling the size of the industrial plant here, maybe tripling the power grid. And we really need to do as much of this as possible in the next 10 years. So, you know, chop, chop. We got to get on. I mean, I, I live in Arizona um, and there's construction. It's just been crazy. Arizona um, is definitely place, one of the boom states. <laughs> Intel is massive here. There's these Amazon warehouses popping up everywhere. So, um, you know, I travel quite a bit and you just see construction just going nuts. So yeah. hopefully, now just keep in things. mind that when I say double for the country and triple for the power grid, it's not going to be evenly spread. There are relative winners and losers, <laughs> but everyone has an opportunity here to play. Well, we just need to find out the, the water situation because that Colorado River can only sustain us for so, so long. <laughs> yeah, that's going to get a little ugly. Um, the very, very, very short version there is Colorado and California are probably going to cut a deal behind your back and you'll just be left with whatever's left. Now, that means, among other things, shut down your fountains in Phoenix and no more golf courses. You do that, you, you stretch things a little bit further. <sighs> Uh, I don't know. No All right, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll, we'll, we'll have to figure that out because Vegas, I think, is worse <laughs> off than we are. So we'll let them we'll let them implode first. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so in the in the couple of speaking engagements that you've had at the ELFA in the past, and I believe you're our um, main speaker again this year, um, just interacting with our industry, Peter. Like, what are your thoughts there? 
well, you guys are the ones who make things happen. So it's like my like the favorite presentations I have are community development groups because they're trying to change what they are and trying to figure out how to take advantage of things. Uh, I love speaking with farmers because they think the furthest ahead. And I love speaking with folks that build things because they're where the rubber hits the road. And you guys are like in two and a half of those groups. Uh, so from my point of view, whenever I'm mingling with your folks before or after, I'm getting a, a look through the keyhole at the wider world about where the changes are going to be happening, where the dynamism is going to be. So yeah, I'm mining you guys for information as much as the other way around. And I love it. Interesting. Interesting. But yeah, I could definitely see that. <laughs> we have a we have a quite an eclectic um, you know group of professionals and what is leasing uh, 1.8 trillion on yeah. you a little know, bit of couch change just, there yeah just just just, 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 a, just a little bit <laughs> so how did you um, you know I guess growing up did you want to be a geopolitical strategist you probably didn't even know what that was oh god no right yeah no i mean that. i was the kid who wet himself in third grade speech class the the idea of getting up in front of a large crowd and just babbling on for an hour or two that would have terrified me uh but i've always been a map guy i've always wanted to know why things work the way they do and at my previous job it was i was the only generalist they had everybody else was a specialist in the middle east or in agriculture or whatever it happened to be i was the only one who kind of tied it together and what we discovered quite accidentally is that meant that most of the clients wanted me to be the one doing the presentations and the briefings because i could bring connections from different sectors and different parts of the world and different time frames together and make it all relevant for them as opposed to just giving them a stove type piped presentation on a specific sector or a specific uh, region it may have been not exactly what they asked for but it gave them what they needed uh, and then when I went out on my own, I guess it's been 13 years ago now, uh, a fair number of the clients followed me. And now I do this. That's, that's phenomenal. Um, but I yeah, never I mean, planned it. <laughs> no, getting up in front of a big room, I can imagine you, what's the biggest audience you've ever spoken to? 2,700. Like the North just... American Potato Federation. Doesn't McDonald's own all those? I'm just kidding. We, would, we don't need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Frito Lay what, would be the uh, largest <laughs> consumer. <laughs> uh, it just shows my ignorance there. Sorry. Uh, McDonald's Bad is joke. the top five. Bad You're fine. Bad joke. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, was there ever that sense of obviously you're very confident and you know your you know your information? So that's step one, right? To well, but you can talk around whatever else, right? But it's, I just sit there and I get up in front of maybe a couple hundred people and it's like, ah, it's like, how do you like <laughs> maintain actually, that? You know, once you break about 100, 150 people, it actually gets easier because if you tell a joke and it catches with just a few people, the laughter ripples. But Small groups are hard. Groups under 20. Oh, because, you know, if one person laughs, everybody else smothers it. It's fair. That's fair. Or if you have people that know what you're presenting on better than you. <laughs> well, I, I try not to do those presentations. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. It's fair. My first uh, sales job I ever had, um, the guy was like, hey, didn't you just travel to Seattle last week to see a couple of clients? Why don't you pitch us the sales team? Man, meanwhile, I've been there for three months. Why don't you give us your presentation, which you gave to them? No pressure. No, it's totally bombed it, but whatever. <laughs> so yeah, smaller groups are a little tougher. I definitely agree with that. And then from a, I guess from a writing perspective, did writing come natural to you? At my old job, I was writing every single day. So yeah, it's something that's kind of been in my blood. Did a lot of creative writing in college and immediately after. And what I've discovered, especially since the first book, is you know every time you, I give a presentation, I have to learn the world again through the client's eyes. And you do that for 10, 15 clients and you get a chapter. Well, I've done 750 presentations now. So uh, especially the fourth book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, that covers all the economic sectors. I don't want to suggest that that was easy or that it wrote itself, but I'd say 80% of the research had been done on the day we made the book pitch. So it came together uh, with a disturbing amount of speed uh, compared to some of the others. <laughs> and when you put out the first one, 
uh, some jitters in regards to, okay, I'm out there, I'm a public presence, but now everything's in a book, you know, books are definitely forever. Is anyone exactly. going to read this? Like, you know, if you're going to get a lot of good feedback, you're going to always get those naysayers or whatever people that are out there. I think these word haters. But um, what was that like when you kind of put out your book and you got your initial feedback from it, Peter? Well, I had done a lot of due diligence at my old company. And so there were certain governments that had me on the lists, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, most notably. And there's a substantial portion of so the first two books on Russia and on China and how they just aren't going to make it the distance. So once the books started coming out, um, intelligence services and bots and trolls really started to target me. And it was a little spooky for a while. I've gotten used to it now. And so now when people who are in like the MAGA right or the crazy left come at me, I'm like, whatever, dude, I've dealt with the Russians. Uh <laughs> But it takes some getting used to from going from being someone that most people don't recognize to like being in an airport bathroom at the urinal and people wanting to shake your hand. It's just, it's an adjustment, uh, especially when uh, things start showing up at your house. Anyway, uh, it's all worked out, uh, but it has been a learning experience. It, it remains one. <laughs> Just imagine the first couple things. You're just like, come on. It's and like, what just, just happened? Keeps, <laughs> keeps coming and coming. So note to self, if I see you on an airport or at an airport, just stay away from Peter. No. Because as long as it's away. not in the bathroom, I'm pretty much okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me 30 seconds, guys? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm kind of busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, I see on the website, there's a section where it says, like, just ask Peter, like, mm -hmm. Is the majority of that stuff like constructive? Is are people really going there, or you just get a bunch of people that are just trolling? Uh, well, if if it's obviously a troll, we um, we you know delete it, and if it's a problematic troll, we block it, and if it's a really pro problematic troll, all that information goes to the FBI. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I would say about a third of them are honest questions. Um, which in for this sort of thing is a really high hit rate. Most people don't break five or six percent. Uh, we have a very, very high, very, very constructive engagement with our newsletters, which are free at the moment. Uh, and and we try to, we, we certainly don't try to respond to everyone, but we do take those questions into account and they shape what we do in the future because what people are curious about is what we ultimately want to be discussing. There's a lot going on in the world. We shine lights where we can. Sure, sure. And then of all the projects that you've worked on, and, and if you're not allowed to answer this question, I completely understand. Do you have like a favorite or one that you're like, God, I wish I had more like that? Well, we kind of split everything into three groups, well, four groups. We've, we've got the newsletter and the video logs on one hand, which is all public. Uh, we've got the in-person presentations for clients, which run the gamut. We do specific consulting projects, which I obviously can't talk about. Uh, and then um, in the aftermath of some of the presentations, we have what I like to call the necklace guard presentations, where they take us into a back room and basically just grill me for several hours. Uh, within those, we run the gamut. But really, the ones I really enjoy the most are the community development groups because they're trying to change the way their community works. They're trying to set themselves on a new trajectory, and they're trying to do that in the most educated way possible to fit into the world as it changes. And so whether I'm doing that with the Texas uh, State of Texas Export Board or a community in the Ohio River Valley or a, a state that is trying to change or move up the value-added change, uh, people who are trying to understand themselves a little bit better and trying to change how they function. Uh, that's hard. That's brave. And I love helping people do that. Sure. I mean, all they're trying to do is be better. Yeah. Uh, not a potential third world organization who's trying to gain the system. Well, every <laughs> once in a while I do one of these in a foreign country too. And those, <laughs> those are great as well. Sure. Sure. Um, I'm just trying to think of like any of those projects stand out from a, in a foreign country perspective. Is it more like community driven trying to, how do we get better at certain things? Well, I, I gave a presentation in Poland earlier this year, and it was the first time I had ever been in Poland. I'm basically talking to them about the rise and the fall of countries during the globalized era and how, you know, the Germans had this 70 year bull run and it's over. 
Uh, their population is bombing now, and within 10 years, most of the major names that we think of when we think of German engineering are just not going to exist in Germany mm. because there's no staff. But Poland has a demographic that is a lot younger, and so it has this moment to shine. The question is, what is it going to do with it? Uh, Polish history has been defined by the rise and the fall of Germany and Russia. And both Germany and Russia are coming off of a high point and are about to just nosedive at this time that Poland's going to have a golden age. Uh, the opportunity for the Poles at this moment in time is immense. The question is, what will they do to take advantage of it? And no one can answer that but them. Right. Yeah, as I say, you could probably make some recommendations, but it's going to be up to them. <laughs> it's going to be up to them to, to see them through. <laughs> Um, so with the, I guess, just populations decreasing, um, you know, a big part about equipment finance too now is AI and just like automation and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And we can go down that road forever, Peter. Um, do you think that um, AI can help replace some of these, like the lack of, I guess, human capital to run it's businesses? Bits and pieces, two problems there. Uh, number one, AI in the way that it seems to be manifesting, and it's an evolving technology, so if it evolves in a different direction, <laughs> I reserve the right to change my mind. Uh, oh, sure. <laughs> for the most part, is affecting white-collar work, not blue-collar work. So mm -hmm. the problem we're having is as demographics age and the baby boomers retire and the global workforce contracts and we need to double our industrial plant, most of that work is blue-collar. So AI can nibble around the edges of it, but it really can't attack the problem head on. Uh, the second issue is AI is probably not gonna proceed nearly as quickly as we think. And I'm not just talking here about the market pullback we've seen in the last several weeks. Um, we have this pattern all the time. People get excited about artificial intelligence. They overinvest in it. It doesn't work out. We have a crash and correction, and then we come back to it a few years later. We may be going through one of those periods right now, the, the winter part. Uh, but more importantly, we're not gonna be able to make the chips. Um, the, the high-end semiconductors that allow artificial intelligence to work uh, all come from one town in Taiwan, but more importantly, their supply chain is the most vulnerable supply chain, the most exposed supply chain, the most multi-step supply chain on this planet. And if we have individual countries like Germany start to falter, we're just not going to be able to build these chips in volume. So we're going to have to ration those chips and decide where we are going to focus our efforts. Do we use them to crack the genome to save a billion people from starving? Do we mm. use them for manufacturing so that we can reindustrialize more quickly? Do we use them for defense and cryptography in order to prevent the fall of the Chinese and the Russian systems from turning into a uh, hacker's paradise that we then have to deal with? Do we use them to stretch our capital? So it goes a little bit further because we're entering a capital dearth because the baby boomers are retiring and they're liquidating their savings. You know, we're going to have to pick one of those things. And I'm not sure we're going to pick the manufacturing option. There's, there's a lot of ways that this can go and most of them aren't up. Yeah. I mean, if it's those three, um, Probably number three wins. <laughs> just based, I mean, it, it based ultimately based is human like, nature. It, well, it's, just, it's most likely to be a government decision because no one else is going to have the authority to do that. But it all depends yeah. upon which chip manufacturers do well and which technologies work out. We're currently in the process of frontiering a new one. And we just don't know yet. Hmm. Now, is there, is there a main reason over there? Is it, is it resources? No, it's the supply chain. There's 9,000 companies involved in making these fabs function. I mean, they may be physically in Taiwan, but the Taiwanese can't build or operate those things themselves. It requires the whole ecosystem. And Got half it. of those 9,000 companies only produce one product and they have no global competition. So if they go away for whatever reason, there's no chips. Interesting. It's <laughs> crazy. Um... <laughs> Uh, uh, so my next question I have is, um, I was introduced to an organization that you're passionate about, MedShare. Um, you know, how did you get involved with MedShare, Peter? So every few months, we kind of look around the world based on our assessment of what's happening. And we look for a place where there's a temporary need. 
So for example, during COVID, we had half the population that was in lockdown for a significant amount of time and, and a third of the population, their jobs were in severe danger because everybody's lifestyle changed. And so we went from having the most food secure situation in the country's history to something significantly less. And we found a company called, or a nonprofit called Feeding America that links up individual donors to the whole constellation of food banks and food support. And we partnered with them for about a year and a half in order to help people out. Uh, what we're doing with MedShare is something similar. We, we looked around the world, we found people who for temporary reasons, for reasons that were not their fault, were having trouble. And we settled upon Ukraine because of the Russian invasion. And what MedShare does is they come in and help communities who temporarily are unable to look after themselves from a healthcare point of view. And specifically with Ukraine, they provide surgical kits, fuel for generators and generators for hospitals because the Russians have been targeting the uh, power grid. Uh, so we basically started setting up these matching funds twice a year where anyone could match the funding that we were providing uh, in order to help them out. And we know we've raised several hundred thousand dollars as a result. Uh, I don't know what the specific number is because <laughs> you donate directly to MedShare. We don't go through their accounts or anything. Uh, sure, but sure. it's been it's been wonderful watching them grow and increase their footprint in Ukraine specifically. They they provide assistance for people beyond Ukraine, and I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't donate to that. Uh, but we try to go for places where the uh, the sharp end of the stick, I think, is the best way to phrase that. It is really sharp. Uh, and Ukraine is a country that under normal circumstances struggled, uh, but was able to take care of their own. Uh, sure. They they need some help now. Sure. And we've uh, we've featured them at a couple of our regional events that we've had and, um, you know, continue to bring them to the forefront there. Because especially, I mean, for an equipment, we get used equipment all the time. Um, it might not mean much to, you know, an organization that's like, ah, what is this residual value of this? Is it really going to help me out? But this can really make inroads somewhere else. Absolutely. So, I mean, this this is yeah. a country that is going to have, I mean, assuming they survive the war, they're going to have a multi-trillion dollar reconstruction program going on. Uh, and you guys kind of fit into that. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. Um, from a last question I have on equipment finance, if there's people that are just getting into this industry, um, cause I want to say like the long timers. And when I say that, I said jokingly before we started recording that this is my 20th year and I'm still one of the younger people <laughs> in this industry. Um, you know, so these guys have been through these economic cycles, uh, between, oh, you know, 2000, 2001 and 2008, 2009. So but there's some younger people that have only seen this trajectory going that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, who knows what we're doing right now? It's just, it is what it is. Any advice that you have, um, I guess, to the industry on like where we're at and where do you see this? Well, I mean, up? there are two, three huge things that are dominating. Number one, with the baby boomers retirement, the labor force is never going to be as liquid or as cheap as it is today for at least another 20 years. So you just hire now. Uh, because it's just, it's not going to get better in three months or nine months or 90 months. You're going to have to wait for a whole nother generation to enter the workforce. That's the 2040s. Uh, second, capital. Baby boomers are retiring. They're taking their money with them. We're never, ever going to have a capital environment again like we did five, 10 years ago with 0% interest rates. That's never coming back. Uh, and it won't start to kind of mellow until the millennials are the big capital providers for the country. Well, that won't happen until the mid 2030s. So this capital and labor environment that we're segueing into, it's we're only at the very beginning of that transition into a much more expensive system. And you're just gonna have to deal with that. That's part of the environment. But against the backdrop of that, doubling the size of the industrial plant, tripling the electrical, oh my God. So yes, it's high cost. Yes, it's inflationary. But the business opportunities are absolutely massive. And so partner with anyone you can in local or state government to get those contracts and get them as soon as possible, because labor and capital is only going to get more expensive. We're really in an environment of first mover advantage. Perfect. Thank you for that, Peter. And um, I guess in closing here, I ask everyone who comes on this program to give me a little fun fact about themselves. Um, so no pressure, but outside of 
you're traveling, um, you're doing the work that you do. What do you enjoy doing? I am a long distance mountaineering backpacker. I like to get 50 pounds of food and just disappear into the woods for two weeks at a time. In fact, I just came back from three weeks in Yosemite. Uh, I have to, the world never stops. And so this stupid thing uh, is basically a bear trap around my neck uh, most of the time. So when I need to unplug, I need to go someplace where the phone doesn't work. Uh, so I go into the mountains. And while I'm there, I reset and uh, sometimes even write a little bit. That's awesome. Um, I know we were talking a little bit about uh, Winter Park beforehand. Like that's my idea of hiking. I've, I've never done one of those like two weeks or three weeks, but they have some beautiful trails up there, man. They're great. And, you oh, know, I'm, I'm never going to tell people to not go in the mountains and not do trails, but I don't like trails. I like going off trails. So I know I will not run into anyone because people are the worst. People are, especially there. I mean, you watch a lot of movies <laughs> that just like, Oh, where are you going? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Good for you. Bear spray. Like what do you, you know? if I'm in grizzly territory? Absolutely. I've never had to use it. Okay. Yeah. Well, when I was up in uh, Idaho a few years ago, they were like, make sure you have bear spray if you're going out on, for a hike. And I'm like, really? Okay. Yeah. Northwestern Wyoming is one of the spots I'd like to go. It's the densest concentration of grizzlies in, in the country. But again, I've not yet had an encounter. <laughs> okay. Well, let's make sure that continues to happen. I don't want to be that person <laughs> where it's like, way to go, dude. Yeah. Hey, I'm on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Well, well, Peter, I really appreciate your time today, sir. Um, I, I guess one more question I have. So you're speaking at the end of October at our ELFA annual convention. Obviously, we have a lot going on politically <laughs> in the next seven weeks. Do you have any potential recommend uh, thoughts in regards to where you might see things in seven weeks from now? Are you talking about the election? Is that your back way of trying to get me to talk oh. about it? I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to. I try to stay away from that as much as possible. But if I have you here, I might as well just. Yeah, ask no, the it's no. I mean, seven weeks from now, it's going to be really obvious. So I doubt I'm going to have to talk about it much. Um, the very, 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 very short version is that Donald Trump's consolidation of the populace has resulted in him driving the business community the national security community, the fiscal community, and the law and order community out of the Republican coalition, and he just doesn't have the votes. Um, and independence, he has told that their vote doesn't matter and that the general elections don't matter. And their general response to that in the midterms, if you remember, was to vote against Trump candidates by four to one in the elections that were up for grabs. So you put those two things together and there's absolutely no way that Donald Trump can win. And what we're going to see over the next seven weeks or now that the independents are actually answering polls, that start to manifest. So just since uh, Harris became the nominee, we've seen a lot of red states become swing states and a lot of swing states go blue two months from now uh we're we're talking it's not going to be a landslide it's going to be a wipeout and the question is what happens to the republican party on the other side of the election because donald trump will now lead them into four ever greater election defeats and humiliations well thank you sir thank you sir for that i was trying to stay away from it a little bit but you know well, then you shouldn't have asked here, about right? it. <laughs> no, it's inquiring minds, myself included. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, sir. Well, I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for being our special 200th episode. Um, appreciate your time, sir, and look forward to seeing you here at the end of October. Thank you. See you soon.